Yeah, the, the swap, yes, the, the question is, does the swap create contingent? The swap actually goes on the bus, right? So if there are many swaps at the same time, then yes, it will create contention. Our goal is to have very few swaps. Okay, so what's going to happen here is, right, that every time that a thread wants to go into the critical section, it'll perform one swap, and that's it. After performing one swap, I'm in the queue, and I'm just waiting for the value to change, right? And so I'm not generating multiple requests like I did before, but just one, and that's the win here. No, no, so to performing the, the swap on the tail will be a sequential operation, okay? It's just that, you know, if you have 40 threads, okay, 40 operations, you know, on the bus of a modern processor is nothing, okay? 4,000 is interesting, 40,000 is a problem, okay? So that's where you win here. Okay, so, great. And so the moment the guy releases, by writing this copy, the cache of this guy will be updated, and then he can go into the critical section. And there's not going to be a lot of interconnect traffic, because only one guy was looking at this location, this one. OK? Good. And, you know, and when, yeah, and, and so, and then it'll be released. And once it's released, again, the tail will point here, and this is what the situation will look like. Now, I just want to show you the code very quickly, OK? So I have an atomic Boolean variable locked. It's initialized to true, OK? And I have a, um, a tail that is of type uh, pointer to a node. And I have these nodes, OK? Uh, sorry, I have a thread local variable that keeps a, a, a pointer to a node, and um, I have, uh, you know, I have an uh, operation. The first thing I do, right, is I try, you know, to perform a get and set that is a swap onto the tail. Okay, so tail dot get and set my node means I put my value, the pointer to my node, into the tail. And what I get back is whoever was there before, OK? And then I spin on that. I spin on what I got until I see that it's released. And then I go into the critical section, OK? Um, OK, now, now, you know, the, the um, the unlock procedure is, you know, just very simple here. All I do is I just release my node, right? And then after I've kind of put a value of false into my node so the other guy can see it, then I recycle this uh, variable. So every thread recycles by taking the node that it was actually um, um, looking at, okay? And I'm not going to explain how this is, of course, I'm cheating here in terms of the Java. You can look in, in our textbook on how this is actually done. OK? Good. So, so a CLH Q lock, OK, um, has good performance because the lock release affects only the predecessor. OK? So when I release the lock, only the predecessor is invalidated. And therefore, only the predecessor um, has cache traffic. And therefore, I don't overload the system. OK? But the problem is that this only works if I have a cache coherence protocol and essentially what we call a uniform memory architecture. OK? And I'm going to explain what uh, NUMA is in a second. Questions up till now? Yes, a question there. Say, say it again. So, um, no. So, when you create the node, you create the node with true so that when you insert it into the list, whoever's looking at it will be locked out. 
it, it is set to false when you release it. I did, I did uh, set it to false uh, here. Initially, it was created as true. Oh, when you create, you're saying when I create the initial creation of the lock, I should have something pointing to false. Ah, yes. Thank you. Um, no. So, it, yeah. Later. If you come, I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> Good. So, okay. So, so, let me go on now to talk about, about um, non-uniform memory architectures. Okay? So, now... If I, if I want to think about um, um, non-uniform memory, okay, um, the idea is this. What does a modern multiprocessor machine look like? Okay? A modern multiprocessor machine, most likely, okay, if it's small, okay, we're talking, let's say, um, uh, you know, 72 nodes, okay? In the near future, 100 nodes. So around 100 nodes are built in a cache-coherent fashion, where essentially there is shared memory, and the distance for, of every um, thread to go to the memory is about the same. Okay? The latency to go to memory is about the same. Okay? But when you build a machine that is um, very large, you know, like a lot of the, the hardware that we use for big simulations, where there are you know, uh, 90,000 cores in a machine, okay? In that case, okay, we can't possibly have it be cache coherent. I can't design a bus, okay, that will allow me to be coherent in this way, okay? So, so in such an architecture, okay, what happens is, I have a local piece of the memory, and if the thread is spinning on his local piece of the memory, okay, then that really is very fast. But if you go to spin on somebody else's memory, okay, so think of the whole machine as being distributed with having a lot of pieces of memory, okay, then if I go to a remote piece of, of it, okay, this, the cost of doing this read is very high, okay? And many times there will not be a cache coherence protocol because it would be devastating to try to make this whole thing cache coherent. Okay? And so if you think about these, this kind of non-uniform memory architecture, okay, then typically, you know, if you used a, a CLH lock and it tried to spin on a, you know, on a remote piece of the memory and there wasn't a cache coherence protocol, then it would be generating a lot of traffic and would defeat the whole design of this lock. And so I want to design a lock that will fit with an architecture whether it is NUMA or not, okay? So I don't have to know if what I have is NUMA or not. I just want an, a lock that will work for all architectures, okay? And this lock is what's called the MCS lock. This MCS design uh, by Miller, Crummy, and Scott um, is actually, um, you know, the kind of architecture, lock architecture that you will find um, most prevalent, okay? So, like, for example, in Java, the lock that is built into the Java language is a version of an MCS lock, okay? Yes, when you do synchronize in Java, okay, it's, it's an MCS lock, okay? Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but, but the basic design is MCS, okay? Um, all right, so um, MCS will give first come, first serve, spin on local memory only, and small constant size overhead, whether the architecture is cache coherent, NUMA or not, okay? How does it work? 
we're going to modify the design of CLH just a little bit. Okay? Each node now is going to be a flag bit and also a pointer. Okay? And initially the pointer is null. If a thread wants to acquire the lock, it creates a node, okay? puts the value true here, just like we did in CLH, okay? and now it's going to do the swap. Okay? And the swap now, okay, I get the value of the guy before me, the tail points to me, okay, but now what I'm going to do, right, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spin on this record because this record could be very far away from me, okay? So I really want to spin on my record because I know my record is in my memory. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put a pointer, I'm going to redirect a pointer, once I know who the guy before me is, I'm going to redirect a pointer from him to me so he knows where I am. So that when he releases the critical section, he'll go and update me, so I can now spin, I'm sorry, um, so I can spin on this record. Okay, so purple will spin on the purple record. And if another red guy comes, okay, and does an acquisition, he creates a record like this, does a swap, and again, he looks at this one, the tail points to his record, and he will update this pointer so that purple will know where to do the update. Okay? So the spinning will now be local because each thread is going to spin on the record that it brought. Okay? And so this is where I spin on. When the purple guy releases, he's going to follow the pointer and update this record. Yes. I, I'm going to show the code and you can see that there's not a race. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And so now he can, he can uh, go in. So here's the design of the MCS lock. Okay? So I have a variable, a boolean, in, in each node now I have a locked value and I have a next pointer. Okay? And what I do to, to, do a, to do a lock, here's what I do. I create a new Q node. This is my node, the one that's going to be local to me. It's going to sit in my piece of the memory. Then I'm going to perform the get and set, the swap on the tail, putting my, a pointer to my record into the tail and taking whatever was there to know who was before me. Then, right, I'm going to check and see. If the guy, if there was nobody before me, right, that is the queue was, um, sorry, if the queue was not empty, there was somebody before me, okay, so pred not equal null, okay, then I set my node to true, I'm preparing it so that somebody knows the whoever, you know, uh, is, so I can't go in now and whoever is going to update me will have to change this to false. And I go to the guy before me, and I point him to my node. This is the setting of the pointer to lead the guy before me to my node so that he can update this variable. Okay? And then I spin. I spin on my node, qnode.lock. That is my node's locked variable. Okay? Now... So that's my lock procedure to release the lock, okay? To release the lock, what I do is this. I have to check and see, you know, if I see a successor, okay? Now, here's the thing. Remember, for every guy, I have a, uh, the purple guy, there's a pointer here, okay? This pointer might lead to somebody that I have to update when I leave, but maybe there is no such guy. Maybe there is no guy here, okay? How can I find out if there is somebody there or not? The only way to find out is by actually looking at the tail pointer, right? If the tail pointer is pointing to me, then there's nobody there. If the tail pointer is pointing to somebody else, then I know that I have to go release somebody, right? Okay. Who do I have to release? 
How do I find out who it is that I have to release? I have no way of knowing. I have to wait. I have to wait for them to tell me. Okay? So this is a little bit tricky here in the queue lock. Okay? I'm actually relinquishing my ability you know, to move forward by myself. I have to wait for the other guy. I want to leave, but I can't really leave. I have to wait for them to update me. Okay? But still, this lock really delivers really beautiful performance. So let's just look at the code for this, because it's a little bit tricky, um, the, the code for releasing. Um, so, oh, this is just the update. I prepare to spin, I, I spin on this thing, then he releases me by updating my record. Okay, so here is the code for that. So, um, to unlock, this is the unlock code, okay? What I do is this. Um, I look at qnode.next, okay, and I see that it is null, okay? So I'm, I, I see that nobody's updated me that there's somebody to release. So now I have to check to be sure that there's nobody to release, okay? So what I do is I look at the tail, okay, and I look at the tail in the following way. I use a compare and set operation. How many people know what a compare and set is? How many people don't? Okay, everybody does, so we're good. So I do a compare and set or compare and swap, right? Setting Q node to null. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking to see if it's pointing to me, and if it's pointing to me, I set it to null. So I am in one atomic operation, right? Checking whether or not I'm the last guy, and if I am, I'm completely putting a null there to disconnect, right? In one shot. And, and then, right? Um, and then what I do is, right, if, if the situation was that I failed this, right, then I um, wait, right, until somebody updates my pointer. So either I, either, the, either I succeeded in the compare and swap, I was the last guy, so I put a null there and I go home, or I wasn't the last guy, I failed the compare and swap, and therefore I have to spin here waiting for this uh, other guy to tell me where he is so that I can update him. And once he does, then I just put false there, and now he can go in and I can leave. Okay? Did this help uh, with the... Um, it, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. Um, so, questions about this? Yes. Right. So, the way you avoid garbage collection here is by actually having a protocol where threads you reuse the, the nodes. Okay, so just like I said about the CLH lock, I can also recycle the nodes, right, so that everybody just reuses their node, and that's how I do it. Okay? Yes, question. So, were you, we want to use this kind of a lock when we are expecting the other guy to release the critical section quickly. Right? And so the reason you don't sleep is because the whole design of the MCS lock is really designed for the contended case. Okay? Um, in Java, for example, just so you understand the context of this, um, in Java, for example, the design of the synchronized operation for Java is that when one thread is accessing the lock, Okay, it doesn't create an MCS lock. It's just essentially a bit. Why? Because um, you know statistics on programs show that for most programs, most of the time, the first thread to access the lock is the only thread that will ever access the lock. Okay, it's kind of a funny thing, but that's how it is. Okay, so when one when more than one accesses the lock, we expand it into an MCS lock in which case we are expecting threads to finish up quickly, okay? Because it's going to be a contended lock. So that's the kind of situation that we have here, okay? And so 
I'm expecting the other guy to finish quickly and update me so that I can go in and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, <coughs> was, is there another question? Yes. So the leaving the MCS lock is not a lock-free thing. Yeah, the, the departure from, it's a kind of a funny thing, I, I'm, thank you for saying it, that I expect the departure from a lock to be lock-free, right? Uh, but we understand what you mean. You mean that basically, once I want to leave, I can leave easily, right? Without essentially being delayed by other threads, and that is not the case here. So I am dependent on other threads when I want to leave the lock. So this is a property of the MCS lock, I agree. Okay, good. That question actually leads me to the next uh, uh, lock that I want to talk about, and this is an abortable lock, okay? So what if you want to give up waiting for a lock, okay? This is surprisingly something that happens. For example, in database locking, okay, often the situation is that I want to try to grab a lock, but after a while I have a timeout, okay? It's better to forget about it, some transaction, leave it, and go do something else, okay? So I might want to actually get out of the waiting for a lock, and the question is, how do you do that, okay? So, um, what if my lock is a back-off lock, okay? If my lock is a back-off lock, then aborting is just trivial, right? All I need to do is just, you know, return from the lock call and I'm done, because nobody knows if I'm there or not. I don't stop anybody by virtue of actually acquiring the lock, right? So I don't need to clean anything up. It's completely weight-free in terms of the departure, and I have an immediate kind of return. So this kind of fits what, uh, what uh, the gentleman there asked, right? It's just a beautiful way to just have an abortable lock. But what if, okay, what if, you know, I have a queue lock? Because we understand what the advantages of, our, of a queue lock are relative to, you know, uh, a back off lock. I'm actually going to get very small delays, very little overhead in terms of, uh, you know, cash coherence. But I still want it to be abortable, that I can leave, right, and not have to wait for another thread, okay? So with the queue lock, I can't do that, okay? So what can I do then? Can I have a way to depart quickly once I've decided to abort? Because when I abort, right, when I want to leave the lock, I'm typically doing that when I really don't have time, right? I timed out, now I've got to leave, now you're telling me I have to wait for another thread to show up. That doesn't work very well, right? Okay? So, what I want is the following. If this was a queue lock, for example, right, the way I'm, I'm used to the, the queue lock working is, right, they're all spinning there on these true values, and then this guy gets a false, right, and then he leaves and updates this guy who gets a false, and updates the other guy who gets a false, and everybody is happy, right? But if, for some reason, right, this guy left, wait free, just goes off, okay, doesn't update anything, right? Then what would happen here is that, you know, this guy, uh, the green guy, would update it to false, right? Sorry, the green guy would see the false, update the blue record, but the red guy, you know, would never see it because no one would update him, okay? And so we've got to overcome this problem. And here's how we do it. So I want to show you an abortable CLH lock. So this is a Q lock that is abortable, okay? And how does this Q lock work? So what I'm going to do is, okay, I'm going to remove the node, okay, in a weight-free way, okay? And the weight-free way that I'm going to remove the node is just let the other guys deal with this problem. I am not going to deal with the cleaning up, okay? 
I'm just going to do an update of a pointer and let the other guys do the cleanup. So here is how this law code work. I have the tail, I have, you know, this uh, uh, pointer, and I have a special value, okay? A distinguished value that I'm going to call available. And then I'm just going to use, a, you know, I'm going to do terrible type, a terrible type of programming here where I use, you know, a pointer to a specific type of record as a Boolean value on this thing, okay? So this pointer, okay, if it points to available, okay, it means the lock is free. And if it, and otherwise, you'll see if it's, it points to nothing, okay, um, sorry, if it points to nothing, then it means the lock is busy. And if it points to, um, you know, a specific node, that's the node that I have to clean up. And I'm going to show that in a second, okay? But just remember that pointer to this special record A means that the lock is free. Okay, so, um, purple guy wants to acquire the lock, okay? Creates a record with this pointer, you know, um, pointing to null, okay? Which means the lock is not available and not aborted, okay? Now, I go and do the swap, okay? So purple in the CLH lock is now spinning on this, on this green guy, okay? And, you know, he sees that the pointer here is pointing to available, which means the lock is free. That's like the value false before. And he goes, and he can go in, okay? So if he sees that, he knows he can go in. Now, if you see null, you see this pointer, if the pointer is null, it means that it's not free and the request is not aborted. And if this guy aborts, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this pointer to point to the guy before me, okay? And the reason I'm going to do that is, remember, this red guy is going to be spinning on the blue record. If he suddenly sees that instead of being null, th you know, this points to a guy before him, then he's going to move to looking at this one. If he sees suddenly that this pointer points to available, then he knows he can go into the critical section. Right? So the red guy spins on the guy before him like in a CLH lock. If the pointer here points to available, that means that he can go into the critical section. If it points to a guy bef before him, it means he has to move to look at this guy. If it points to null, it means just keep on spinning. Okay? So the predecessor is aborted and I have to go see him. And therefore, he will spin here and everything will work fine, even if the guy disappeared. Okay? And the cleanup will be done by this guy, the red guy. Okay? So now the lock is mine and he can go in. So let me just quickly, before we uh, go on a break, show you a little bit of the code for this lock. Again, you can see that the code for the locks is getting more complex as I require more things from them. Okay? There are more kind of uh, uh, runs. Okay? possible uh, synchronization issues. So, um, so here's, uh, you know, here's uh, my record, this special record available, okay? And um, I have a tail pointer, and I have a local pointer to my node. And in order to do a lock, okay? And by the way, I have some kind of timeout on this lock, right? Because I might want to timeout. And what I do is I create my local node, right? Um, I update the, my, my local record, and I set the, uh, you know, the pointer to the possible guy before me to null. And now I do a test and set, a get and set on the, on the tail, right? So now... You know, the, the, the tail is pointing to my record. I know who was before me, just like in a CLH lock. And now I do a test. I check to see, is my predecessor null? Okay? And if he's not null, right, then is he available? Okay? And if so, then I can uh, return true, right, and leave. Otherwise, right, otherwise I start waiting right? So I'm spinning around, right? 
and I have this loop where I'm kind of spinning around and waiting to see if I need to time out. Okay? And while I'm not timing out, okay, I read the value of my, the guy before me, the, the po this pointer, and if the pointer is available, I can leave, okay? Because I can go into the critical section. Otherwise, right, if it's not null, right, then I, ha you know, then suddenly there's a pointer here to tell me that the guy before me has left. And if he's left, then I want to move to the guy before him. And that's what I do. I move to the guy before him. Now, just like in the, uh, in the uh, MCS lock, what do I do when I time out? Okay, now I need to synchronize. Okay, uh, I need to do a little bit of synchronization. So, think of it like this. Okay, if I'm going to leave, I, I have to tell somebody that, you know, that I'm leaving. Okay, and I have to figure out, right, it, you know, if there is somebody behind me, right? So what I do is, um, you know, I, what I do is I do a compare and set on the tail, okay, to check if the tail is pointing to me, right? And if it is, okay, then when I'm leaving, I set myself to, the, to my predecessor, okay? Um, so think of it like this. I check, do I have a, a, a successor, okay? And if I don't have a successor, then, you know, I'm just, I just set, set it to, to my predecessor and I'm done. But otherwise, okay, if, if the CAS failed, okay, then I do have a successor. And I have to tell him about the guy before me. And so I have to set this variable. I'm sorry. Then I, then I set the, the variable to, to, to my pred, right? And so... Um, so I've set it to my pred, and uh, sorry, I set it here to prev equals my pred, and now I can leave. Now, the final thing is, of course, uh, you know, uh, unlocking. Again, in the unlock, well, right? In the unlock, I have to also do the unlock just in like in an MCS lock. Again, I might have this kind of a of a run. So what I have to do is this: I have to check to see if it's still pointing to me, and if so, I turn it to null. Okay, but if I fail this thing, right, then I have to set, you know, the prev to available. Then I have to tell somebody about it. Okay, so again, I do this thing. Okay, and if my CAS is successful, right, there was nobody there, right, then I have to do nothing. So it's again, you saw in both of these cases, both the case where I leave and the, you know, where I abort and the case where I um, leave, I have to use a compare and swap. So essentially, if you think about the CLH lock, the original CLH lock, I used a swap to insert the value in there, but then to leave, I just had to write a value. So this lock was really, really efficient. Now, I've added essentially, to get these additional properties, I've essentially added a compare and swap upon the departure. So the big change from the simple CLH lock to the MCS lock and the abortable CLH lock is this idea that in order to depart, I actually have to do some synchronization work. I actually have to use a compare and set to depart. Now, once upon a time, this used to be a big deal because compare and swap was an expensive operation on most architectures. But I have news for you. Now it's not, okay? On the new Intel and, and, and AMD architectures, you know, doing a compare and set is not an expensive operation. So we shouldn't be scared of it. Use as many as you want, okay? And, and, and the little bit of synchronization that you need to do here is, is a, an issue. You have to do it, but it won't affect performance that much. Question, yes. Sorry? Yes, if you, if you have a big NUMA architecture, then you are paying a, co a cost. I agree. That is correct. That is correct. Yes. When? When? Yeah. Yes. 
Well, I do the allocation only once, right? So I do the allocation once per um, lock. And in fact, I can take the node. Let's say that, that in my code I lock three locks. Then I have to allocate three nodes, and I can use these three nodes repeatedly throughout. You see what I'm saying? You don't have to allocate new ones every time. Yeah, just the algorithm? Yeah, sure, sure. Sure, sure, I can go back to the algorithm for a sec. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what I was saying was, okay, what we do is this. Uh, let me just show it here. So essentially everybody, you know, is spinning on the guy before them because this is a CLH lock, right? Okay, so and my hope is that this guy is in my cache, right? And now, suppose this guy wants to leave, okay? What he's going to do, he's going to use this pointer to point to the guy before him so that I, that am looking at him, will know to look here instead of here, okay? So what he does is he updates the pointer here, and when the red guy sees that this pointer is not null, he knows to follow it and start spinning on this record. Um, blue, blue knows about green because blue did a, a swap on the tail and the tail was pointing to green and now blue, so blue knows about green and he points to his own record. Yes? Yes? Okay, great. So I think, let me just take a look here. Uh, um, Yeah. Okay. So I think this is a good time for a break. I think you guys, I exhausted you, so have some coffee. <laughs>